Hello and welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. And this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. So thanks for joining us tonight. Or you'll be listening in the day, folks. We're pre-recording in the night. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I want to welcome to the show regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser. Hey, Emily. Hi, Olga. Good to see you today. Good to see you too. And hello, Representative Mike McCarthy from St. Albans. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me, Olga. I see this pop up in Representative Kornheiser's feed uh, sometimes, and I have been a big fan, so I'm honored to be on this evening. Oh, flattery will get you everywhere, even onto the onto the happy hour. <laughs> Well, thanks for joining us and, and thanks for diving in. Uh, folks, tonight we're going to be talking about redistricting, also sometimes called reappointment, I believe. Um, and it is a process that the legislature undertakes every 10 years, right after the census numbers come out. And I believe, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, but your um, committee or the committee who, who looks at redistricting started reviewing the census numbers actually this past August. And then over the kind of fall and winter put together some tentative maps and dis new districts. Um, and now that the new session has started, we're starting to really seriously look at these new districts and, and see what's changed and what hasn't and maybe where some borders have moved. Um, could you set some context for us, please? Yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there. So it is true that um, the, the census is kind of the driver. So we're required to every 10 years by the federal constitution have a, a decennial census, a counting of not just you know, the voters, but every single man, woman, child, every single person that lives in the United States. And when we look at how that impacts the legislative session, we typically would get the numbers sometime in the spring of the year. Excuse me with my phone going off, I should have silenced that. Um, so we typically would get the numbers in the spring of um, the, the year following the census. So we would have gotten them like March of 2021. And instead we didn't get the numbers until about six months later, like you said, in August. So that has changed the entire timeline for the process that we have to go through in the legislature of figuring out how to have 150 house members in one and two seat districts and the 30 senators in their, you know, one, two and three seat districts uh, this next time around. Uh, Chittenden County will no longer have a six seat Senate district after this uh, reapportionment. <laughs> That's a, another big one. But yeah, oh, so we do this every, every 10 years and um, we are gonna take those 2020 census numbers. And so there's, you know, about 658,000 Vermonters in change according to the census. And when you divide that by 150, that means each representative in the house that Emily and I serve in is going to represent 4,287 people, give or take. And so it's that give or take that really matters when we're talking about the puzzle of figuring out what all the new districts look like. So quick question for, um, for our listeners, but also for me, I just would love to clarify in our constitution, do we, are there numbers set out like we have to have 150 reps and they have to have so many people um, or, or like, does that change? How does that work? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the 150 number uh, comes out of the constitution. Um, and it used to be actually that there was one legislator in the house for every single town and gore in Vermont. And so you had, you know, over 200 people but the person that represented Buell's Gore, you know, population, I don't know how many people, like 60, uh, represented the same amount of people as the person from Burlington who represented thousands. And um, in 1965, I believe, there was a Supreme Court case uh, that established a principle of one person, one vote. And so across the country, um, legislative districts like for federal office for Congress and all the way down to state and local offices need to be proportional. So we've got to have, mm -hmm. you know, the same number of people represented by the same number of representatives and senators. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so 
where are we now with um, what what the re where where in the redistricting process I are think we? Before Mike answers that, I just want to sort of throw in the reason I wanted Mike to be sort of the person that joined us for this conversation um, is quite specific. And so, you know, we've had the chair of GovOps on, Sarah Copeland Hans is before to talk about various things. We've had Representative John Gannon on various times, who's the vice chair of GovOps to talk about things. Um, really wanted Mike on because he wears two hats in the house. He sits on the GovOps committee and he's the assistant majority leader. And oh, interesting, so, okay, thank you, Mike. And reapportionment um, can become a really complicated political issue. It's certainly much more a hot button political issue outside of Vermont than within Vermont, partly because we just, our communities are um, sort of easier to make distinct, but mm. like really the particular dual, um, dual role that Mike gets to play and what he gets to see through that and how that sort of duality plays itself out through the redistricting process was an important part to me of bringing into this conversation. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful, Emily. Appreciate that. Yeah. So the, the other word or, or title for assistant majority leader is the whip. So I am the whip in <laughs> the majority uh, for the Democrats in the House. And um, that comes with um, you know, supporting the majority leader and the speaker and and being part of setting the legislative strategy and figuring out, you know, what bills are going to come to the floor when and how we're going to talk and um, share our values and our message in public. But it's also about figuring out, like, how do we um, actually you know, do the process of governing? Because we're in the majority. We, we have to be the people who are essentially uh, responsible for the legislation that gets passed, at least on the House side. So, uh, I take that role really seriously, and I take the role of being on GovOps really seriously. And I think what we want at the end of the day is for the vast majority of Vermonters to feel like we listened to their local elections officials, that we um, were looking at how do we best uh, do our duty to the Constitution and to the statutory requirements. And the Vermont Constitution is really specific about how the House is going to be made up. You know, it, it talks about the 150 members and it says they can be in one or two seat districts. Uh, and then right after it talks about they can be in one or two seat districts, it says the General Assembly is going to figure out what those districts look like. And they've got to make sure that there's equal representation. And so that that question of what does equal representation mean? Mm -hmm. uh, is it just about the population uh, or is it about other things? Like in our laws, we talk about having those districts have some priorities in their formation. So we've got to think about maintaining areas of common interest. So we think about like, do these two towns that we have to stick together in a district, do they share a school district? Are they geographically connected? Like, can you get to one from the other or is there a mountain between them? So there's lots of things to think about when we think about the puzzle beyond just the population and making sure everybody's proportionally represented. It's, it's a real trick. And right now in my role as the whip and sitting on that committee, what Emily's saying is I'm hearing from everybody who's really anxious, like what is my district gonna look like when I run in just a few months? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, a, this is a time of high anxiety for people in the legislature. And, and I'm trying to help everybody calm down and figure out how we best divvy up this beautiful state into districts that make sense for our communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so the and process, starts with the census and sort of ends with the legislature. But in between, there were some steps that I think we left out that I think might be helpful for listeners mm -hmm. who are paying some attention to get some specificity on. Yeah, Emily, that's uh, really important. So when Olga did her overview, she talked about how over the summer and the fall, there was a committee that was working on those census numbers and sort of doing the preliminary work of how could we solve the problem of doing this reapportionment. And um, the Legislative Apportionment Board is a seven member board that has representatives who are um, from really all three of the major political parties, Republicans, Democrats, and progressives. Um, and there's a real diversity of opinion about sort of the, the priorities of uh, how the map should be drawn. And um, what the, the main point of debate was the kind of crux of their um, 
disagreement on the legislative apportionment board over the summer and fall was whether every single house district in the state of Vermont should have just one seat mm-hmm. and sort of ignore the two seat tradition that we've had in a lot of our districts. Right now we've got a mixture where about two thirds of the seats are one seat districts and then um, about a third of them are two seat districts, especially in the kind of more compact uh urban areas like in Burlington, for instance. Um, But then you look at a city like Brattleboro and there are three single seat districts. So um, there's it's kind of uh, different in each community. And um, the Legislative Apportionment Board got that census data in August. They came out with some preliminary maps in October. They sent those maps out to the um, boards of civil authority. So that's the select boards and city councils combined with the justices of the peace. So those are your official election boards in each of our communities. And they gave feedback. Um, so, you know, of the 200 plus communities, about 140 said, yeah, we like that map, it's fine. Or they said, oh, we really hate that map. It cuts our town in half and it sticks us with a town that doesn't even have anything in common with us. And why would you do that to us? So there was a real spectrum of feedback from all those towns in November. And um, a lot of the angst came from the fact that when you divide the, the state into 150 single member districts, you end up with a situation where a lot more towns have a a division in the middle of the town and you Mm. can't sort of keep, you know, the the whole community uh, in one district. Um, And that- Can I give an example? Cause I think that's sort of hard to imagine. So I like, you know, I'm sitting in Brattleboro with our three perfectly, well, in the last reapportionment, they were perfectly divided three districts. They're gonna need a little bit of wiggling now, but we have three separate districts. It works out fine, the community finds their way. Um, And then sort of right north of us, we have the Putney, Dummerston, Westminster as a two seat, you know, one district that has two seats in it. And if that was gonna be divided into two seats, likely Putney would get carved in half, right? Like that's sort of the easiest way to imagine it. And some folks in Putney would be sort of voting and aligned with Westminster. And some folks in Putney would be voting and aligned with Dummerston. I know Putney pretty well, and I don't think they would like that at all. I think they like, you know, Putney is Putney and they have their general store and they have their Mm co-op and they have their common and they have their school and they want things to be sort of centered in their own nexus. And Mm -hmm. so for me, I'm like, single seats are amazing. Like this is so straightforward, but I can imagine that if my town was divided in half, I'd be very uncomfortable. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, that's a great example. And the other thing about that to, you know, not to single Putney out, but I don't know Putney's town clerk and you guys are kind of on the opposite uh, side and uh, end of the state from me being up here in the Northwest and St. Albans. But, you know, in any town to use your Putney example that gets cut in half to make a new district that makes um, the elections for state representative much more complicated. Because every Mm -hmm. voter who comes through the door, if you split that town and there's half the town is voting in one legislative race and half the town's voting in another, that means that the clerk and the elections officials need to, you know, maintain the separate voter rolls and give a a distinct separate ballot with a different race to every single voter that comes through the door and make sure that the right voter is getting the right ballot. So it does complicate things. Um, And, you know, our our elections are run at the local level. a lot of times, mostly with a volunteer effort in Vermont. Uh, and and so uh, a lot of times in more rural districts, having a two seat district that keeps the towns kind of whole uh, can, to make the numbers work out can make the elections a lot easier to administer. Mm-hmm. So um, we have, uh, and for listeners, I will link to this web page in the show notes, but there is a page on the legislative website that kind of outlines what the the work the board has been doing and and the different maps. Um, But as I understand it, there's there's like a final map, but it hasn't been voted on by the legislature yet. So this is a really confusing thing. It's actually probably the number one reason I wanted us to talk about (laughs) this right now, because we voted out officially like floor vote, all of the pomp and circumstance, like a regular bill 
we voted out a draft for comment, basically. I don't think we do that for anything else. It's we're doing I mean, a lot the, of things that we don't usually do this year, but yeah. yes. <laughs> and so <laughs> for constitutional amendments, um, you know, those have to be voted on twice, but like you can't change them in between. You just vote on them twice. This is we voted out a draft for people to talk about, and then we're gonna take it, the committee's gonna take in the comment, and then the fi the final version that we send over to the Senate could be completely different from whatever this first draft is. It was really just like, we're offering this up to the communities to discuss. I think it's totally confusing and pretty cool actually all at once. Yes. The map is called final in the um, name, which makes it even more confusing. Just saying. <laughs> yeah, so so I wanna, I wanna unpack that a little bit with you, Olga, because it is really confusing. So the final map is the final map that came out of the legislative apportionment board process. Mm -hmm. And so recall, you know, you've got those seven people, they've had their heads in the census numbers, they've got their own philosophy about single member versus two member districts and all that stuff. And four of them, four out of the seven supported a map that was just single seat districts. Mm -hmm. And they passed their map and that sort, and then they sent that out to the BCAs and they finalized it at the end of November. And then the, the alternate map that three of the members of the board supported was also finalized. So there's a final <laughs> version of the majority adopted map and the alternate map from the legislative apportionment board. Both of those maps are a suggestion to the legislature. So we right now are really just at the beginning of our process of looking at those maps, everything that the boards of civil authority and the public are telling us and trying to figure out, okay, what do we like and what can we support in each one of these districts? And then if we make certain choices in one corner of the state, it has a domino effect mm -hmm. on the region around it and all the way up to the end and wherever you end up. Um, and typically we kind of work from the trouble spots in the Southern parts of the state where there were a little bit under the deviation where there hasn't been as much population growth or there's even been a little bit of loss. Like I think about Rutland City, for instance, mm -hmm. compared to Burlington, you know, Burlington's grown a whole lot. Rutland City's lost a little population. And so we're, the, the sort of gravity is shifting north. Um, and yet we still wanna keep, you know, communities kind of whole and have people really understand where the representation is. So yeah, we're just at the beginning right now, now that we've passed that initial map of taking the official feedback for the legislature. So the lab did their whole process, they finalized their process, that all happened last year, and now we're at the beginning of the legislative piece, and we basically have seven or eight weeks now, I think, uh, is the general uh, thinking to figure out what our final real adopted map is going to be in the legislature. So. Um, that it's seems like a lot of time. Board. It also is giving me anxiety because it's going to go really fast. <laughs> it will. <laughs> well, and so right now the boards of civil authority in a lot of communities are having conversations around this draft that we just voted out for comment. And they're being sort of lined up to provide testimony and comment to the GovOps committee so that they can be informed by what the boards of civil authority are thinking. So later this week, um, Hillary, our town clerk in Brattleboro, is coming in and testifying before GovOps. She's really looking forward to it. We have the special circumstance of our town meeting, our representative town meeting, which is also impacted by reapportionment. And so, um, and that sort of, Wyndham County is one of the first counties that's testifying, and then they'll sort of, you know, go through all the other folks. Great. Yeah. We have just over five minutes before we need to hear from some underwriters. I'm curious, Mike, you know, we're working off of 2020 census data. And as we all might remember, 2020 was a little bonkers. Um, the census was a little bonkers. Uh, down in this area of the state, we have um, a number of folks who maybe moved to the area um, during the pandemic, but it's kind of a second home. So they, they kind of have a home base elsewhere in the country. So I'm just curious, like how did the board work through those numbers? And um, 
I, I don't mean to be inflammatory, but like, how good are those numbers? So I think about the census like a snapshot and a point in time. Mm -hmm. And we're required with our process in the legislature to take the numbers that were given uh, and to work with those numbers. We also have the flexibility though of going like, when we look at the 4,287 ideal district, we could go two or three or maybe even 400 people. That's probably pushing it constitutionally, but we have some swing. So we're really more focused on making sure the districts conform to uh, the existing political boundaries like town borders, trying to keep you know, districts within a county, um, hold school districts together as much as possible. We're looking at those things more than we are really delving into, oh man, were there you know, 60 more people than we really think live in the town of Wilmington? Um, you know, um, there are some towns that submitted in their official comments to the legislative apportionment board that they've um, issued a whole bunch of housing permits and they have a bunch of development going on. I think of South Burlington, for instance, their BCA mm -hmm. wrote this long, beautiful report about how they think they're going to have another thousand people within just a year or two. We can't use that. And so mm -hmm. we've got to take the data we're given. I will admit that there are some towns that look like they had crazy spikes. Um, I don't know really, even with some of those towns, even in uh, Wyndham County, that seem to have had kind of like a COVID boost in population because those towns are really small. It seems like that extra population could have a big, big impact. I don't think it'll have make a huge difference in most of those cases in terms of how the district gets drawn because we do have some wiggle um, to provide there. But, you know, this was the Trump administration that was administering the census. Um, they obviously, uh, you know, it's, there are new stories coming out all the time of, that are increasingly providing evidence that there were political motivations and the fact that they wanted to have some questions on there um, to specifically discourage people who, you know, might be uh, immigrants who don't have documentation from responding to the census. Mm -hmm. um, all of those things combined together uh, do create a little bit of concern, but I think for the most part, what we're seeing with a somewhat fuzzy lens as we look at the districts that we're trying to draw, the population movements statewide seem to reflect what we all kind of intuitively know. You know, Chittenden County is really growing, the Northwest part of the state's growing, mm -hmm. the, um, especially the South uh, uh, West part of the state, like when we think about Rutland and Bennington hasn't grown as fast or is losing a little population. So all of that kind of makes sense. So I think when you get right down to the block group level and you're looking at the tiny little little places where sometimes it seems like there's maybe too many or too few people, when we zoom out a level, um, it, we can get to a place where I, I feel like give or take, the census is a good snapshot, um, but it doesn't tell us what things are gonna look like in two years. And this districting process is for the next 10 years. And mm -hmm. we take that really seriously. Yeah, I've Thank been thinking you. about, did we do an episode on the census, Olga? I kind of remember us doing that. We talked about doing it. I don't think we dove in okay. as deeply as we wanted to. Okay. Um, you know, in sort of some of the more mountain towns in our area, certainly folks who are at their second home in a more long-term capacity were counted as part of the census. We also know that a lot of folks who came up here in that way are now still here. And mm -hmm. so they were counted and there's, and at the time it seems strange that they were counted and yet they're still here. And so it makes sense that they were counted. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how, and Tristan and Molly and I have been talking a lot about how it doesn't actually make sense to any of us that um, the district that I'm in is the one that didn't change when we both have like, we all have a very sort of um, clear understanding of massive housing areas that were emptied um, mm -hmm. in the district that I'm in. And we know of brand new housing developments that were built in those other districts, but so much happens in terms of how many people live in a household that is much more invisible to people than um, the number of actual buildings that people are aware of. And so over 10 years, we know throughout America, the composition of individual households has changed a lot and the type of um, the number of people who live in what type of household has changed a lot. And so I think 
that's a little bit more invisible to us census wise. And mm -hmm. in 10 years, we get to do it again. So if like, you know, the housing pattern is super different three years from now than now, like we'll fix it then. Mm -hmm. Good point, thank you. Um, anything we wanna leave listeners with before we, we head for a break? There's a lot here. I would really encourage people to go to uh, legislature.vermont.gov and take a look at the reapportionment page on the House Government Operations Committee website. Um, the House Government Operations Committee website has a ton of information. It talks about the timeline. It's got lots of maps. Uh, and it's a really good summary of a lot of the more technical stuff in a digestible way. Um, we, we did a lot of effort over the last few days to make it really accessible. And if people, uh, if we've piqued your map geek interest, uh, <laughs> I would consider myself a map geek, proud to be one. Um, take a look at that website and, um, and you know, feel free to hit us up with questions and feedback. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh on that site, uh, Emily talked about some town, like town clerk Hillary Francis coming up to give public uh, input. Can individuals give input or if they want to, should they go through like their town clerk, their board of civil authority? How would that work if, an, if a citizen wanted to do that? Yeah, citizens can absolutely um, submit written testimony. Um, they can uh, go, there's a, a link there for Andrea Hussey, who is our um, uh, committee assistant uh, for house government operations. If, if they'd like to be scheduled to testify before us and they can do that via Zoom. Um, and I, but I would say, you know, contact your state representative. You know, if you live in uh, Brattleboro, you've, you've got fabulous representation and uh, Emily Kornheiser and Tristan Tolino and Molly Burke and you know any one of them I'm sure would be able to get the message through. Fantastic thank you. Hey stay tuned everyone the Montpelier happy hour on WVW 107.7 LP Brattleboro will return after a word from our underwriters. Hey, beautiful people, welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you're just joining us, I am your host, Olga Peters, and I'm speaking with regular contributor, Emily Kornheiser, one of three reps from the town of Brattleboro, as well as rep Mike McCarthy, who is visiting with us via the interwebs from St. Albans. So glad you are both here. Um, as always, you can find the happy hour uh, on WVEW, wherever you find your podcasts, as well as BCTV. We thank all the, the channels who carry us. And Emily, what do we need to remind listeners of? Well, Olga, the views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier happy hour are those of the hosts and the guests, and not any of the stations that broadcast our conversation, not any of our employers, nor friends, nor loved ones, just the individuals saying and thinking the things. Thank you very much. So Mike and Emily, yeah, we've been digging into redistricting, AKA reappointment, and, and kind of looking at how this latest round of census numbers um, may or may not be changing some of the, the districts in Vermont, the legislative districts. And I've been kind of sitting with this, getting ready for this conversation, because as someone who grew up in one of the hill towns, there have been times where um, I've been part of Wyndham. There were times when we were like a Wyndham Bennington district. Um, and and it was always interesting to me because it, it showed me how um, these, these districts are both on a map, but they're also kind of emotional. Um, and, and how weird it would be for me if I was going through um, my town and seeing like a sheriff from Bennington County uh, sitting on the side of the road. It's like, w wait a minute, what? Um, things, kind of things like that or when, you're, when your lawmaker might change after redistricting. Um, and it, it's also making me kind of sit with on the national stage you know, there's a lot of concern and harm been done around gerrymandering. And so I know that's kind of a big bucket, but could you guys uh, kind of unpack that for us around, you know, the emotional part of our, we might have for our districts, but then also that, that definite political game 
that has been played with districts and what those might mean for the state. I want to start answering that with a slight and loving correction to something you've been saying, Olga. So it's reapportionment, not reappointment. Oh, sorry, so, that's me being dyslexic. <laughs> no, but what I think is actually really, and I, I knew that, but I also think that <laughs> it's actually like a really interesting linguistic difference. And I'm going to like play it out just for the sake of conversation, even though I don't, I'm not, I don't think it was intentional. So with reappointment, there's sort of this idea that maybe we would be appointing people to something and it would be about making sure that the right people get in the right seats in the right districts, right? And that's gerrymandering and we're not doing mm -hmm. that. But reapportionment is about the proportions, right? that mm -hmm. are going into each district. And it's about counting the number of people and making sure that those proportions are proportional to community boundaries, proportional to the number of humans who are voting. Um, and it's sort of much more of a mathematical and holistic process rather than an anointing or an appointing. And I think in Vermont, we're really focused on this idea of reapportionment. Part of it is it's a little bit easier here because we only have one congressional district. And so when you're talking about reapportionment or redistricting and gerrymandering, a lot of the focus is on congressional districts and we only have one. So it's pretty hard to move it around because it's the whole state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a really good point, Emily. Um, the fact that we don't have to have a, a tough conversation about uh, congressional redistricting and reapportionment, uh, it makes our lives a lot easier. But we also in Vermont, I think we might be second just to New Hampshire in terms of how small our house districts are in population relative to the representative. So with each of our representatives representing about 4,300 people, there's 150 of us over in New Hampshire, they have 400 in their, uh, the lower house of their general assembly. Uh, and they, so they've got 400 reps uh, who each represent, I think closer to 3,500 people. Um, bigger population total in New Hampshire than Vermont, but that is very small. Like when we look across to New York, for instance, I mean, th their state assembly people represent tens of thousands of people. Um, so our districts are really close to the people we represent. You know, Emily and I represent just a few thousand of uh, our neighbors. And mm -hmm. that means that our democracy in Vermont is really intimate. And it also means to a point that you were making earlier, Olga, that how the districts are drawn can mean a whole lot to you personally, like who that person is that represents you that goes and makes laws and votes on your behalf can be a much more personal thing than who your congressperson or senator is in a state like Vermont where our democracy is really small and really <laughs> close. Uh, and I love that. It's, it's really a joy uh, because of that. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you. and if so, and if your um, legislator winds up being in a community that is not like living in a community that's really hard for you to access from your community, that means you're not going to run into them in the grocery store or at the library or walking down the street or all of the places where I get like the bulk of my constituent communication from. It is not the email. It is often <laughs> just like walking down the street. And so, um, and I think that's important to people that they can feel that. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, I, I want to go back to some of the, the history of, of gerrymandering in, in this country. Uh, Mike, you talked about our democracy being so intimate. And I think one thing that's interesting about Vermont is because we are so small and because our democracy can be so intimate, we often have this really interesting dance between personalities, you know, the people who are working within the system and then how the system is structured. Um, and I think for the most part, they, they often work, but not, you know, that's one reason Emily and I have this show is they don't always. So when it comes to, um, and I'm gonna say redistricting because now I'm afraid to say the other word. <laughs> um, what do you think that play is between people and the, the structure? Oh, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, one of the we like things, the we like the big yeah, the big presence really here. <laughs> so one of the things is um, so so there's what Emily talked about, which is that when we're looking at redistricting, we really need to think about can you get there from here? 
mm-hmm. are these communities that we have to put together because you know some of our towns only have a few hundred or a thousand people and each one of our legislative districts the smallest unit even though it is very small compared to other states is bigger than that it's you know 4300 people give or take so um, we oftentimes are putting multiple towns together and so when we're doing this process we need to think about do these towns have stuff in common? Do, do, will the person who you know lives in uh, you know Fletcher can they? Should we put them in a district with Fairfield and Fairfax, or should we have them in a district with Fairfield and Bakersfield? And that can make a really big difference, not only in terms of like how that community is represented, but also just who will run and and who's available and what the kind of culture is in each one of the towns that we put together. Um, And so when I think about the personality piece of it, we have a legislature that, you know, was built for gentlemen farmers to go and, you know, spend the off season figuring out, you know, if what the governor proposed was a good idea or not, right? That's kind of the foundation of how things were built. We still operate and as a citizen legislature where we basically, you know, we get a few hundred bucks a week and, um, we end up spending most of that just, you know, going away from our day jobs if, if we're people who are working age like Emily and I are. And, um, and it's a real privilege to serve and only people who can kind of make it work have access to the job. Mm-hmm. And it, it's been a real struggle to figure out how do we make the job of representing your neighbors in this beautiful, intimate democracy. We get to work inside of a museum at the state house, basically this, this lovingly, you know, maintained and manicured uh, place. Uh, It's a real privilege to be able to do it. And it would be much more accessible to more people if we paid people for all the time and the effort that they had to put in. But for the folks who have the power to change it, like us who are in the legislature, to suggest that we and our colleagues should make more money is really a difficult thing to do politically. And so we get kind of stuck. The structure is sort of stuck in this place Mm -hmm. where many of us recognize that it's inaccessible for a lot of folks to run for office and participate in the legislature. And yet politically, the idea that we would suggest that we get paid more seems self-serving. And so we're like, no, we're not going to do that. Um, And so that's one of the things that uh, is a conundrum and a paradox. And I'd like to use fora like this And I appreciate the opportunity to have a really frank conversation about that dynamic and ask Vermonters to really think about, would you support us making it possible for a single parent to be a legislator? Like, I'm lucky to have a partner, my wife, who has a job and I have a job that are flexible enough to allow me to do this work and still be a parent with a nine-year-old and go down to the legislature four days a week for five months out of the year. That's a really crazy schedule. (laughs) And, And it's it's only because of circumstance and the fact that I have a lot in my life that I'm able to do that. Um, and so I think, I think a lot about beyond reapportionment and redistricting, um, how we have some things to work on with the legislature and who gets to show up. Uh, and we've done a lot of work trying to recruit um, a more diverse group of people who don't look like, you know, middle-class white guys like me, um, to serve in the house. And that's been really tricky in large part because of the time commitment and the the lack of support financially that people get once they get elected. And, you know, to be more explicit about it beyond sort of my personally like complicated situation that allows me to do this or Mike's personally complicated situation that allows him to do this. I've been, you know, I I don't think it's news that we're gonna have a seat in the Wyndham County Senate open and in the Senate from Wyndham County open. And so I've been trying to talk to people who might be interested in running for Senate from Wyndham County. And I have talked to many people who have said, who would be incredible, do an incredible job representing our county in the Vermont Senate who have said, I've thought about it, I've thought about it, I cannot figure out a way I can possibly afford to do that. Um, And so they're not gonna run. And these are, you know, folks who would would do our community well. There's another sort of structural piece of this whole conversation about gerrymandering that I want to throw Mm -hmm. in because um, I don't want us to get self-congratulatory about the fact that we don't have gerrymandering here because I think there's some accidents to it. So Mm -hmm. we, our process, which works and actually tends to not have very much gerrymandering in it, 
um, is certainly not sort of international best practice for um, open and transparent election procedures. It's just not. Mm -hmm. But it tends to, it's like historically has come out um, quite fairly, quite equitably for a lot of the reasons that Mike talked about. But there's another reason that it's come out fairly, fairly and equitably over the last 200 years. And it's sort of similar to the reason that we have such an incredibly high proportion, proportion of homeowners here, right? It was, and we yep. congratulate ourselves so much about our high proportion of homeowners, but it's because we never really had redlining here because we didn't have anyone who wasn't white here. And we haven't had that much gerrymandering here because we haven't had anyone that we had to really like protect the vote yep. from. Um, because everyone was white and even that whiteness was a fairly homogenous whiteness. And so I think, you know, there's a lot of really incredible characteristics of Vermont, Vermont geography, Vermont intimacy and all of those things that have prevented the kind of gerrymandering we see other places in the country. There's also just sort of like the reality of the trust that Vermonters have built in each other because they're like each other. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that explicit racism never needed to, you know, rear its head because there was, you know, very few people of color to be racist against. Um, and so I'm curious and want to be um, vigilant as the state becomes more and more diverse that we're able to keep um, what has worked over that time and sort of beware changes in that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. Mike, does that bring up anything for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate Emily being explicit about the fact that we, there are accidents of history and geography that have led to the consequences we have. We also, I think, struggle to make the state house and the legislative process accessible to, you know, people of all different abilities. So, you know, we've we've really had a lot of conversations um, about how do we have the um, transcription of what we're saying appear uh, when we're live streaming the legislative right. process, you know, <laughs> and debating, is it better to have the real time thing that is kind of inaccurate and doesn't do a good job of capturing every single word accurately that we're saying, or is it better to have a thing that comes out maybe a few days later on the YouTube stream and you know that so those issues of access and equity around or do we have a live interpreter like we have at our town meeting right mm -hmm. who's like the legislative live interpreter like right so like there's even a third option that like is a level of resources that we can't even fathom right now but would actually probably be the equitable solution right exactly uh yeah. and yeah and and i would say that you know the way that we have the legislative structure set up the governor's got all the staff and the power and mm -hmm. comes in and tells us a lot of stuff. And then we've got to, with very little staff, kind of pull in the voices that we want to hear from our communities. And I think we've been trying to take the job more and more seriously, even though there are a lot of structural barriers to it, um, to get people in front of us that represent a more diverse uh, spectrum of the opinions and experiences that are in each of our towns as we're considering things. Um, and there's a real effort among folks who are uh, involved in the social equity caucus in the, the House and the Senate to, you know, sort of formalize that and have some best practices for our committee chairs and our leadership. Um, and so I just think we're in this time of enormous change and conversation about what our democracy should look like and who gets to participate. And while we're doing all that, we're carving up the map because we have to do it every 10 years to figure out, you know, <laughs> which which towns are going to be together and <laughs> what those districts are going to look like. Um, the other thing that I, I, I want to make sure that we cover in this conversation has to do with there, there's been a, a little bit of a drumbeat about uh, how well the majority of the legislative apportionment board recommended single seat districts, you know, why isn't the Democratic majority in the state house, you know, just adopting that. Um, and the number one reason I think is we heard feedback from many, many, many communities that really just did not want their towns split. They felt like the towns that they got put in with because of just solving that puzzle um, weren't, they didn't maintain uh, common political interests or respect the existing political boundaries. And all of those things are written into our statutes. And then we look 
add a solution that's written right into the constitution that says, well, we can do one and two seat districts and we have for a long time. Um, and I wanna acknowledge the fact that multi-member districts have in some places in history been used um, like gerrymandering to silence minority voices. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that has been done in places. I don't think that that's how two seat districts have manifested in Vermont, particularly because our districts are so small, you know, they're only representing a few thousand people, even the two seat districts, you know, you're going from 4,300 to 8,600, you're still not talking about a huge area. Um, and um, I think that the, the claim that it's a partisan split uh, is really not a salient argument because on the legislative apportionment board, the three members that voted in the minority on their recommendation, tripartisan. The four members <laughs> who voted for the majority single seat map, tripartisan. There's a philosophical difference more than a partisan one on the legislative apportionment board. And so we're left with two maps from them, a lot of feedback from towns, uh, our own thinking about things like single versus two seat and all of the history of these different regions and districts, and now we've got to do the hard work of debating and compromising all of these little tweaks that will eventually, by the end of this process over the next couple of months, tell us what the 150 members, or at least where the 150 members of the next biennium will come from. Thank yeah. you. It's, you know, it's funny, there's part of the conversation about this one seat versus two seat has been, um, I've heard people say, well, if you have a two, if you're in a two seat district, then you get sort of double the representation. And so your voice is more powerful in, um, in the legislature. And I, as I sort of think about that as a person sitting in a single member district, I, I very much feel that like I represent Molly's constituents and that Molly represents my constituents, like mm -hmm. as three representatives who represent Brattleboro. And even though it's three separate districts by legal demarcations, we always have each other's constituents backs. If there's an issue affecting the town, certainly all three of us are engaged in that. It's not none of it's that simple or straightforward. Um, and I, you know, I see colleagues who might be in sort of more rural areas, two of them will absolutely band together for an issue that impacts their region. And one member who's sort of part of that district is not part of that conversation. So um, I think it's a sort of um, catchy talking point, but it's so different from my lived reality, even as a person in a single member district. And I've been thinking about it a lot since the first time I heard someone say it. That is interesting because um, I see your point, Emily, even though Brattleboro does have three single member districts, I see it as three people representing Brattleboro. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. I spent an awful lot of time this past weekend talking to the select board from Fairfax, mm -hmm. a neighboring district of mine, who are very concerned about some of what they've seen in the legislative apportionment proposals. So, <laughs> you know, we do kind of all, um, you know, we serve our regions in a way. And I think for most of us, our approach to legislating is about doing what's best for the whole state, mm -hmm. right? Like we, we are, are there to represent our communities but we have to do what's best for all of Vermont. We can't just have the narrow focus of like, I can't just represent St. Albans. Emily can't just represent Brattleboro because you know, what affects a child or a senior or you know, a taxpayer in Brattleboro is gonna affect me because we really are one state and we have you know, one giant big budget that we have to think about and we're trying to figure out how to you know, pull our resources and do the right thing for our communities and our neighbors. And um, I can't actually even fathom what it would look like to just represent, like to just think about the needs of West Brattleboro and to do that in isolation. Like I can't even, I mean, you know, like I think I'm more attentive to flood zone issues because of the geography of the district. Um, mm -hmm. But above and beyond that, like most of the issues that are important to my constituents and impact their lives are, you know, true for so many of your constituents, Mike's, in like a totally different political, totally different social, totally different economic landscape up there. It's just, yeah. Yeah, we, it is a, 
it is a diverse state in a lot of like our geography and perspective, uh, even though, um, you know, it's an old white state in a lot of ways. And so <laughs> I think that like uh, what people need in Brattleboro and in St. Albans, um, you know, we, we are going to bring our flavor of what our constituents want, but we've got to, you know, we're passing laws that are going to affect every single one the same way. And um, it's, you know, we've got to, <laughs> those words on the page really, really are going to matter to people. And, and we take that job pretty seriously. Um, but it's the, this redistricting process, it's very hard to imagine a scenario where we don't have a huge majority of our house support the final map. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that happened 10 years ago, and I really think it will happen this time around. And so the noise about, you know, partisan stuff, I mean, you know, we have uh, on the GovOps committee is uh, seven Democrats, three Republicans and a progressive. Um, none of them are going to let us get away with anything, you know, if we <laughs> on the majority tried to, you know, give ourselves some kind of wild advantage. Um, there's going to be, you know, uh, a compromise on a lot of the lines in some places, but I don't, I think it's such an openly transparent process. Uh, it can be confusing and it is complicated, but um, it, we just, the numbers are what they are. We, mm -hmm. it's just about solving a puzzle in the way that works best and respects all these funny ideas we have about, you know, my town boundary and the school district and all of these funny little invisible lines that we've put all over the place. Thank you. Um, we've been talking mostly about the House and of course, both of you are in the House. Is there anything happening on the Senate side that we should just quickly note? Oh, I love how you're smiling. For the sake of our radio listeners, um, I, think, I think Mike is trying very hard not to like, um, laugh too hard at this. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the technical answer is the Senate has a different process than one, the one we talked about for the House. They actually form a little committee of their own. Uh, and by tradition, the Senate does their map and the House does our map. And mm -hmm. we do send them to the other body like we would with any other bill but they better not mess with ours and we better not mess with theirs. Uh, so there's there's a lot of uh, trust going on that we're not gonna play around too much with each other's maps, but they have to go through the same process that we do. But, um, you know, traditionally the, the Senate was divvied up by county, right. you know, and with proportional representation, um, the especially Chittenden County now is gonna be really split because um, mm -hmm. we passed a bill uh, a couple of years ago that will make it so that during this cycle, um, the largest number of members you can have in a district is three in the Senate. Uh, and so, um, you know, Chittenden County has had six members in an at-large district, which there isn't any other at-large legislative district in the entire country that's like that. Um, so it's that that is where you really get into what Emily was talking about, where, you know, one person in Burlington has six senators. It's pretty wild. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Mike. Um, anything we want to leave listeners with before we we head out for this evening? You're looking. I just think there. this is like this is the nitty gritty bit of democracy. So, like mm -hmm. you know, if folks have a minute to dive in, dive in. Like you can, you know, the Board of Civil Authority meetings are streamed now. You can watch those um, in Brattleboro at least. Mm -hmm. um, you can tune into any of these conversations that GovOps is having about any of this. There's so much fun map data. There's so much fun census data. Like it's all just, and this is sort of what shapes it all. It's pretty cool. Thank you, um, I've, Mike. I've been using a free app called District Builder that allows you to sort of play around with uh, districts. And it has like the state and the county and the block group and then the little blocks that only have like 50 or nine or a dozen people in it. Um, so if you go to districtbuilder.org, I think um, that's a, a fun little program uh, if you want to try to build your own map. Um, but yeah, uh, there's just a lot to this. Uh, but at the end of the day, we're going to have uh, 150 districts with about 4,300 people or, you know, 112 districts with 4,300 4, people and then, you know, 20 districts with two people or <laughs> however that works <laughs> out. So, you know, it's uh, it's really wild to um, just 
be able to be a part of this uh, very, uh, you know, this this is really like Emily said, the nitty gritty of democracy. Like this is how we figure out how each person gets uh, very close to equal representation in our state legislature and in our lawmaking. And we take it pretty seriously, but it is a lot of fun. Like I really, really love the maps. I love thinking about each of these communities. I love being able to hear from people in all of these different communities because, you know, I grew up in Vermont, but I don't know, you know, that many people from Putney or Pulteney and thinking about how many legislators confuse Putney and Pulteney, even though they're <laughs> on the opposite sides of the state. Um, like that stuff is great. Like that's the part of it that's really cute and fun. And, um, and so even though it's a very serious job and we take it really seriously, it also, there's a lot of joy and camaraderie and um, it's, it's fun. I love, love doing this work. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Uh, Rep. Mike McCarthy, thank you so much for joining us to talk about redistricting. Emily Kornheiser, of course, thank you for being here. Um, Mike, if people want to find out more about you, do you have a website? Do you work? Yeah, um, <laughs> my website is I like Mike VT. So I like Mike VT for Vermont dot com and. Um, yeah, you can find me on Twitter. My handle is I like Mike VT. And um, yeah, the, I really appreciate being invited to the show. I'm a big fan. And um, Olga, thanks for all the questions. And Emily, thanks for the invite. Emily, if folks want to hear from you or, or learn more. Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org and you will find links to all my social media accounts, sign up for my newsletter, get my phone number, be in touch. And of course, we can't say goodnight without a toast. So I want to toast to, quite frankly, the nitty gritty of democracy. And thank you, Mike, and to all your fellow board members. Uh, thank you, Emily, for all uh, you're doing. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Take care. And the Montpelier Happy Hour will be back next week. Cheers. <laughs>